Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. Also, the Amanda Lester Detective Book Series for Teens and Tweens by former writing show producer and host Paula Berenstein. Introducing Sherlock Holmes to the Next Generation. Find out more at amandalester.net. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I hear of Sherlock everywhere. Episode 98, Europe and Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, if you're thinking about Europe and Sherlock Holmes, then this, this is in fact the perfect time. Mm. The perfect time to tune in to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I am Scott Monty. Yes, that's absolutely right. And I am Bert Wolder. I like that with with the extra periods in there. Yes, well we have to use the full stops because there was a story in this morning's New York Times that the punctuation mark, the full stop, the period, the end of the sentence is going the way of all things because of the prevalence of texting and short communications and I say no. <laughs> You know, the result is we're all going to start talking like William Shatner. <laughs> Spock, set your phaser to sun. <laughs> oh, you know, I, there, there's so much going the way of the dodo these days with regard to uh, just general etiquette and rules that we've lived by for years. Yeah. Uh, simply because we are now using communications, electronic communications, to convey information and and speech and and lots of things like that. Right. It's just becoming less and less formal. Yeah. What well, that? that, that's a yeah, that's an attitude of a loser. What a loser's attitude! <laughs> Please, <laughs> loser. Hey, hey, Bert. Yeah, Bert. Yeah. Delete your account. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll just let that one sit there. I, th we'll I would imagine everyone there. knows what we're talking about. Yeah, but. I hope so. And if you, you don't, boy, lucky you. I know, right? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, today we are recording on June the 10th. Yes. And uh, big celebrations underway today in London. Uh, it was the official or the beginning of the official celebration of uh, Queen Elizabeth II's 90th birthday. And it was in all actuality the 95th birthday of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Mm, God bless them both. Oh, yeah. The longest, I think the oldest uh, reigning uh, British monarchs in history. Yes. Past and also the she's the longest reigning British monarch yes. in history. Did you see Vanity Fair a couple of days ago or a week ago, whatever it is? Yeah, I think Annie Leibovitz had magnificent photo spread there of uh, sort of royal family behind the scenes pictures of the queen and prince philip i thought were well, are these recent photos or are these some of the ones that she's done from over the years oh i don't remember i mean they seem to be recent in in terms of capturing them at what i what looks to me like their current ages so they don't they're hmm. not they're not younger uh and i think it was a cover story i just saw it online i think it was a cover story in vanity fair called her inner majesty she was on the cover of the magazine 
Huh. Magnificent photographs. What? Uh, yeah, what, what Queen Elizabeth's 90 years of royal portraits tell us about the monarch. Yeah. Is, uh, is, is the title of the thing. And I, I would imagine, yeah, they include some of Annie Leibovitz's things in there. So, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, in June, one of the reasons why we picked Europe as a topic is that the United Kingdom is hurtling towards, um, Friends, we think we in America have trouble, but in the United Kingdom, they're hurtling towards uh, uh, a referendum, a national referendum on whether or not the United Kingdom should remain inside the European Union. And you know, I uh, occasionally um, refer to different things that the BBC have done from a comedic standpoint. Uh, A couple of months ago now, the BBC talked a little bit about, uh, in one of their comedy programs, talked a little bit about Europe. Did you know that there is actually, not not making this up, there is actually an anthem for Europe? Really? Yeah. This is like a cacophony of, uh, of sounds? Uh, no. There's, it's a, it's a uh, real anthem. It's a familiar tune. So the tune is genuine. The, um, the, anth- the lyrics, though, are made up in this instance. And I've got two examples. This is, the, uh, let's see. this is the version of the European anthem for those people who believe Britain should leave the Union. For almost the next four months, we're a nation divided, though, on everything related to Europe. Both sides even dispute the correct words to the EU anthem, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. According to the outs, the Brussels-approved version is this. European super state is secretly what we desire. We want to control your lives and all your money we require. Do away with border fences, all expenses we can charge. You can leave if you want to be led by Boris and Farage. <laughs> I, I think I could hear Angela Merkel uh, <laughs> just snorting in the background there. Now, there is another version for those people in Britain who believe that the United Kingdom should stay in the European Union. Although many members of the British public tend to use this translation. European Union is something we don't care about. Probably it doesn't make much difference if we're in or out. Debt and crisis, Syria and ISIS, rise of China, worldwide slump. What's the point of budging if the world is run by Donald Trump? Oh, God, let it not be so. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that something? Uh, Yeah, yeah. That's from a British comedy program called The Now Show back in uh, in March, and I saved it just for this episode. Very, very appropriate. Well, uh, before we get to our show now, uh, why don't we pause for a moment and hear from one of our sponsors. While it's quite likely that you've heard the Baker Street Journal called the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946, and we hope you've heard it because we say it every time here on the episodes, we have a question for you. What does that really mean? It could simply mean that it was the first of its kind. Before 1946, no one, no one was producing a regular or even irregular collection of scholarship on an ongoing basis. It could also mean that it's the definitive resource that many Sherlockians turn to when they're looking to delve into ideas past and present on issues small or large in the canon. Or it could mean that you've simply exhausted your Google search and arrived at BakerStreetJournal.com where you stare in amazement at the myriad of choices that lie before you. Well, whatever it means to you, it's clearer than ever before. The Baker Street Journal stands out amid a sea of electronic information today 
about Sherlock Holmes. It stands out as a beacon, a beacon, if you will, of some of the most intelligent and thoughtful papers you are likely to read about the Sherlock Holmes stories, or films, or television programs, or more, for that matter. So, the real question is, why don't you subscribe yet? For less than a dollar a week, you can have access to all of this and more. Won't you join us by going to BakerStreetJournal.com and subscribing today? Ah, and with those sweet strains, let us head on over to the continent and explore homes in Europe, as he was he was known to find his way over there from time to time. Yes. So now that we've headed over to the continent, that means that we are in continent. <laughs> Let's hope not. You know, uh, a lot of people say that uh, John Watson uh, was was uh familiar with women over three continents and uh, i i like to say that it was actually a misquote uh he was actually familiar with three incontinent women <laughs> a story for which the world is not, not yet, yet ready <sighs> anyway so what do, what do we have in mind that we're going to be discussing with regard to sherlock holmes and the european continent well, I think, you know, just sort of taking a look at, at this time, it's a topic that we haven't touched on before. It's very clear that if you just look at Holmes' cases, you know, regardless of the Brexit vote, uh, it's very clear that if you look at the literature of Sherlock Holmes, that Great Britain is in Europe. I mean, whatever politicians may think, <laughs> Europe is the offstage landing pad for a great many characters. It's and it's and it's frequently referred to as Holmes's territory. You know, when Doctor Mortimer calls uh, into Baker Street, he makes a point of uh, referring to Holmes as the second highest expert in Europe, uh, Bertillon being the uh, first expert, at least in his view. So uh, you know, it's it's the grand stage for a lot of the action uh, in the canon and, and outside the canon. Mm. Yeah, and. Uh wasn't it uh, wasn't it his, his very own arch enemy, Professor Moriarty, who is said to have had a uh, or, or at least a, a treatise that he wrote had a European vogue? Yeah, I always thought that had to do with the edition of a fashion magazine. Oh no, no, I, do. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I, I should have seen it coming. You should, a mile have, you should have. Moriarty <laughs> had one of the the oh, first oh. the first brains in Europe, and he kept it in a jar in his office. Uh, right next to the stuffed rabbit. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, obviously, Europe was uh, was very important. There were, there were instances not only where Holmes uh, went over to help solve cases in Europe, and I think they actually played that out pretty well, uh, particularly in the Granada series. Mm. Um, you know, of course, we saw uh, the Red Headed League was the case of the French gold. And uh, he was helping to um, he was helping to solve the case of um, uh, the the, uh, the Mona Lisa having been stolen uh, in in the final problem, and that bridged the two stories together. Mm. You know, where people figured out that Professor Moriarty actually had a hand in the Red Headed League, and uh, and then of course over into the final problem. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was clever. Well, you know, and Bob Katz pointed out. Um, some time ago, one of the things that Bob noticed in his um, scanning of the Sherlockian literature, that, that the greatest evils that usually uh, afflict uh, Britain or um, English citizens in the canon are usually those that come from outside um, Britain rather than, than our native evils. And, and so... Many of the less desirable characters, Baron Gruner as an example, and many others 
uh, come from Europe or, uh, or, or less admirable ca- characters like um, Wilhelm mm. Gottsreich Sigismund von Ormstein. It's true. And, uh, uh, you know, the despotism and uh, disarray of Europe has, has implications on, uh, on Britain and Britishers. I seem to recall uh, the case of, um, was it the second stain? Hmm. That was interesting because uh, Eduardo Lucas uh, was married to a French woman, and there seemed to be some sort of international intrigue behind something that was really, uh, that, that only had to do with the Home Secretary. And it just happened to have uh, involved the Home Secretary's wife uh, having uh, absconded one of his documents and uh, given it to Lucas in exchange for uh, you know, lightening up on the blackmail. Right. And um, they they thought initially that uh, Lucas, well, was it his, um, no, not that they, that they thought it, it actually was the case that Lucas's estranged wife, who was French, had come over and in one of her fits of rage uh, stabbed him uh, in um, hmm. where'd she stab him? <laughs> in the Dardanelles. In in the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that kind of took some of the focus off of the case there because you know all you need is stark raving French woman and uh, that'll that'll set the uh, the English police force uh, off in a tizzy. Yeah. Well, Second Stain is a great case because it's by far the the most European referenced. Um case you know it begins by watson saying it was then in a year and even in a decade that should be nameless mm. that upon one tuesday morning in autumn we found two visitors of european fame within the walls of our humble room in baker street uh lord bellinger twice premier of britain is one and the other is the right honorable trelawney hope secretary for european affairs and the most rising statesman in the country and their whole chatter is all about Europe. You know, consider the European situation. The whole of Europe is a armed camp. And to whom would this document be sent if it fell into the hands of the enemy to any of the great chancelleries of Europe? Europe, 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 Europe. Yeah, European catastrophe. Um, now, you know, this, this actually begs an interesting question. You know, the way Conan Doyle framed this story, uh, you know, that this, this letter that was on the loose could cause Europe to go into war at any moment, mm. at the utmost moment, I believe, uh, Lord Bellinger said. Mm. Um, was, was that realistic at the time? Uh, had, had Conan Doyle framed it in a way that it would have, uh, it would have resonated with uh, the present day readers who were picking up copies of the Strand magazine hmm. was was Europe in that much of a mess? Now, obviously, uh, a few years, about a decade later on, um, w- with the advent of of the the Great War, the First World War, uh, we saw that in fact it was. But uh, this story was written what in the early 1900s. Hmm. 19, 194 or so, 1905. Uh, so, you know, one has to wonder if this was something where people would read it. And even though that he didn't have the details in there, we didn't know exactly the, the how behind it. We just knew that there was a letter, somebody spouted off and it would be enough to set some governments off. Um, do you think that was realistic? Well, I, I don't remember the notes, you know, my, my memory of the last time I, I read it and looking at, um, the um, the accompanying notes from Baring Gould and from Les Klinger suggested basically that the a governmental alliance contained in the missing document would, I my memory is, would have um, certainly been a big story, been objected to by other governments. But maybe that's not so. Mm. Now I now I find that that according to the um, uh, you know, the general chronology that I refer to most is that it was October of 1886 when the second stain um, happened, which is the Bering Gould chronology. 
Right. So you'd have to um, hmm. think about where things were in 1886. Yeah. Which off the top of my head, I uh, can't tell. Was, was Disraeli still around in 86? Oh, I don't know. Probably not. I don't this was, know. Uh, this was Lord Bellinger. Who, who was he supposed to be? Well, there again, you know, you got to look at the notes from Les and uh, or, Bear, or Bill or Bill Baring Gould. I don't remember. It wasn't Gladstone? Was it? Maybe it was Gladstone. Because um, you know, you have that description that people have uh, devoted I, a lot. I, I I don't think it was Gladstone because there was no mention of him arriving with a bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because his Sorry. wife was in the car. <laughs> but I'm bum. Uh. <laughs> um, let me see. I'm, I'm pulling out my uh, Sherlock Holmes reference library. Oh, very good. Much richer in detail than uh, either version of the annotated. And um, let me see here. Lord Bellinger. Oh, right. Either I don't uh, know Changes in the office of prime minister are given in the chronological table at the beginning of this volume. Only three prime ministers, Disraeli, hmm. Salisbury, and Gladstone, hmm. held office more than once during the lifetimes of Holmes and Watson. And only Salisbury and Gladstone did so for the second time during the partnership. Yeah, and Salisbury, of course, had a lot at stake. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, when can we stop? <laughs> well, you just keep putting, you know, teeing these things up. I can't resist them. <laughs> I have only one thing to say. <laughs> uh, um, Gavin Brend wrote, uh, to decide between Mr. Gladstone and Lord Salisbury is no easy matter. Mm. Lord Bellinger is described as austere, high-nosed, eagle-eyed, and right. dominant. Right. This sounds far more like a description of Gladstone right. than of Lord Salisbury. Right. But for this very reason, we think we must choose the latter. Let us not forget Watson's statement uh, that in certain details he is being deliberately vague. Mm. He will disguise his prime minister. The above pen picture can hardly be described as a disguise of Gladstone, we think. Uh, the case occurred during Lord Salisbury's second period as prime minister from 1886 to 1892. Uh-huh. June Thompson, in her magnificent biography, Holmes and Watson, concurs in this conclusion and identifies the quote-unquote letter in question as a document written by Kaiser Wilhelm II without his minister's knowledge, criticizing British colonial policy. Hmm. Oh, there you have it. Yeah. I like that. And it, it, it goes on more. It's a very, very long note. Um, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to read this uh, on your own, folks, you pick up a copy of uh, the return of Sherlock Holmes from the Sherlock Holmes reference library. Uh, I think it's one of the thickest volumes in the, uh, nine volume series. So lots of great notes here on what I think are some of the best stories in the canon from mm. that, uh, that collection. Mm. Very so, good. Yeah. Well, you so, know, it just, it just keeps referring to the basic premise that, that Europe is almost as much of a character in the Sherlock Holmes, in the cases of Sherlock Holmes as London is. Well, that's interesting. I, that, that's a really interesting point. You know, we talked, I guess it was episode 68, 69 with Bert Cools mm -hmm. about the Moor mm -hmm. being a character in The Hound of the Baskervilles. Mm. And, and when you look at the canon in total, I think you're absolutely right about London uh, being a key element in it and, and by extension now Europe as well. Yeah. Well, right. that's what the BBC Sherlock – folks have done so brilliantly is making London a character in the new series mm. as dominant as it was in the original canon. But Europe, you know, is just, um, it's there in the background. You know, it's the scene of Holmes's greatest triumphs. It's the scene of his tragic disappearance. It's a place characters disappear into. Um, mm. You know, it's not enough for Holmes to be the greatest in England, the greatest... Uh, he is – he's referred to as, as standing alone in Europe and it's, yeah. it's just the great stage for a lot of this activity. 
Well, speaking of disappearing into Europe, uh, this was kind of a key element of uh, that, that we found out later on uh, in a study in Scarlet. Hmm. Uh, right. We had a couple of characters fleeing from, um, you know, Jefferson Hope. Yeah. Uh, Jefferson Hope, of course, was chasing Enoch Drubber and Joseph Stangerson uh, across the United States. Mm. And it was interesting. They were in Utah. I found it odd that they didn't head to the West Coast and go, uh, you know, from San Francisco or Seattle off to – you know, Shanghai or Hong Kong or Japan or, you know, one of the, the Asian settlements. They decided to go clear across the United States uh, through Cleveland and eventually New York and then uh, on to London and the continent. Hmm. I never thought about that, but you're right. I wonder why that was. Well, because they wouldn't have run into Sherlock Holmes that way. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, oh, but of course. Of course. The uh, – uh, you know, part of the, the opening scene there where they go to uh, Brixton Road and they find uh, the, the body of uh, Drebber there on the ground with a racha spelled out in blood mm. uh, in, in finger scrawl on the, uh, the wall. Uh, there were no papers or memoranda in the murdered man's pocket except a single telegram dated from Cleveland about a month ago and containing the words, J.H. is in Europe. Mm. There was no name appended to this message. Mm. So, you know, again, Europe being, you know, used as, uh, you know, kind of like that, that bogeyman. And, uh, all, all evil things come from Europe. Come, back, come from or go to Europe. Yeah. 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 So. so what would Britain be without Europe? Well, Is we're it... about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Uh. Now, how about uh, how about some of the other stories where Europe uh, sticks out? We um, we know, of course, that uh, in Scandal in Bohemia, and you already mentioned uh, the King of Bohemia, right? Um, but there were other oh yeah other mentions of Europe. Uh, well, uh, Valley of Fear, you know, is a big one. Uh, again, Moriarty is referred to by Holmes as one of the first brains of Europe. Uh, and all the powers of darkness at his back. And, um, you know, as he's talking about Porlock. And, um, again, there's another opportunity for Watson to refer to Holmes as one who, who already stands alone in Europe, both in his gifts and in his experience. Um, and then Europe, you know, comes up, uh, a lot in, in the conversation about, uh, uh, that MacDonald has with Holmes. Yeah, yeah. His first wife was of Swedish extraction, a very beautiful woman. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. You don't associate his past with any particular part of America. I've heard him talk of Chicago. Um, and he was in California. And then when he, when Douglas left so suddenly for Europe, um, you know, but then, you know, you've got, um, um, this other reference there, Law and Order, that's how he heads it, Reign of Terror in the Coal and Iron District. Mm. Um, from that day, these out outrages have never ceased until now they've reached a pitch which makes us the opprobrium of the civilized world. Is it for such results as this that our great country welcomes to its bosom the alien who flies from the despotisms of Europe? Mm. So. Well, that's interesting now, given... You know, where we are with uh, the refugee crisis and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is it, it is for such results as this, that our great country welcomes to its bosom the alien hmm. who flies from the despotisms of Europe. Hmm. How far we've come. Yeah. Really. You know, so many people seem to be putting up, uh, virtual, uh, and, and, um, uh, not literal walls, but uh, you know, just cultural walls to um, to to keep some of these refugees out. Mm. And a uh, hundred or so years ago, it was quite the opposite. Yeah, and and one might argue there's there are worse things going on today in some of these countries than uh, than back then. Although you know, we didn't have the benefit of as as much transparency and. Uh, information as we do today, but still. Mm. 
Well, you know, a lot of it is around assimilation. I mean, the earlier periods, I think, of uh, emigration and immigration uh, took place in an environment where, for a variety of reasons, the distribution of people, the educational system, the systems of publishing, the language requirements, um, you know, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the bias was heavily organized around assimilation, you know, come to America, come to Britain, right. come to whatever country, and uh, become part of Britain, America, and this country. But um, times have changed, and what seems to be the rubbing point for many of the people who have the deepest current alarms is the basically the lack of assimilation and the then subsequent feeling that what's familiar, true, and national about their country has now changed because of the sudden presence of a very large number of people who don't share any of that. Mm. Well, and then, of course, we have uh, what, what I found very interesting. Uh, of course, uh, mentioned the King of Bohemia before, but also in uh, the scandal of Bohemia, a scandal in Bohemia, we, um, we hear the King of Bohemia mentioning uh, one of Holmes's previous cases, he said, your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe hmm. have shown that you are one who may uh, safely be trusted with matters which are of uh, an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. And he said, at, much, at present, it's not too much to say that it's of such weight that it may have an influence upon European history. Hmm. Uh, and then again, you know, we, we, uh, we head over to uh, the final problem. Hmm. And, um, you know, Holmes mentions to Watson, between ourselves, the recent cases in which I've been of assistance to the royal family of Scandinavia. Uh, so, you know, we've got royal houses of Europe, the royal family of Scandinavia. Um, was, was Holmes the, uh, you know, official fixer for reigning families in Europe? I mean, <laughs> obviously these are, uh, these are stories that did not make it to, Mm. Uh, popular publication is it simply that the royal families shared information among themselves and uh, and basically said hey you gotta try this guy home he, <laughs> he did us a solid here a while back you know right right well since they were all related to each other yeah that's, <laughs> right, that's right. very likely but uh, yeah sure. in in regate squires you know you've got watson saying i had this telegram from leon which informed me that Holmes was lying ill in the Hotel Doulong. So within 24 hours, I was there. Uh, his iron constitution had broken down over an investigation which had extended over two months. Um, the triumphant issue of his labors could not save him from reaction after so terrible an exertion. And at a time when Europe was ringing with his name and when his room was literally ankle deep with congratulatory telegrams. Even the knowledge that he'd succeeded where the police of three countries had failed and that he'd outmaneuvered at every point the most accomplished swindler in Europe. Um, you know, this is a big European triumph. Yeah. Well, I, I think what Watson does not tell us, and uh, it's worth noting, if you look at the weather tables during that time, uh, it was th there was actually an epidemic of global warming and the telegram icebergs were melting. <laughs> And that's why the <laughs> telegram level had risen to ankle level <laughs> in uh, in Baker Street. So, <sighs> so. It was Holmes, Holmes' notorious but little understood paper allergy that actually reduced him. <laughs> I can't understand it, Watson. I'm ankle deep in telegrams and I can't stop scratching. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, clearly, you know, very well regarded uh, – Across uh, the continent, and naval treaty as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to my certain knowledge, he's acted on behalf of three of the reigning houses of Europe mm -hmm. in very vital matters. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good gig if you can get it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we we of course had um, uh, another instance, although it was uh, again back at home, where uh, Holmes was working on behalf of someone in the royal family for uh who who was the illustrious client mm -hmm. uh working against baron gruner right again someone from uh uh the the, the evil parts of europe the foreigner yeah. uh, the, the 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 wife killer you know the incident at the splugen pass 
an opportunity again to avail those services to the uh, the families and the or I- individuals in the royal family. It's true, and and strange things come from Europe. Um, in addition to people, you mm-hmm. know, I'm reminded that in Devil's Foot, uh, Radix Pedis Diaboli, uh, Sterndale says. Um, Except for one sample in a laboratory at Buda, there is no other specimen in Europe. Uh, it's not found its way into the pharmacopoeia or, or into the literature of toxicology. Um, and European science would be powerless to detect it. So, uh, mm. interesting. Interesting indeed. And, of course, if you think to uh, our friend at... Um, uh, our friend over at Camford, mm. uh, Professor Presbury, mm. you know, he he was getting uh, his his supply uh, through a through a Bohemian dealer in London, who presum- presumably represented someone in Prague, uh, and um, that the uh, the packet emanated in some way from Prague was was very clear to Holmes and Watson. Mm. Um, a Dorak was the individual who signed for it. And um, an Austrian stamp with a postmark of Prague was on that package of monkey serum. Hmm. Lowenstein, that's right. Lowenstein, Lowenstein of, Prague. of Prague. yeah. Our own, our own friend Jan, Jan Prager, Prager yes. is Lowenstein of Prague. So, yes. you know, again, the, the outre coming from on the main continent there. Well, is there anything other than, than Holmes, you know, kind of rescuing the royal families that have gotten themselves into trouble, as they often do? Is there anything good that comes out of Europe? Oh, boy, that's a good question. You mean other than chocolate? <laughs> now, there's something. We never have Holmes uh, eating any chocolate in the canon, do we? Oh, that's a good point. I don't think that we do. I don't think that we do. I remember, uh, at least in the Granada production, when it was um, when they're doing the stakeout in the Six Napoleons, uh, waiting for um, Beppo to strike. Um, Lestrade pulled out a paper bag, and and he offered a a, a sweet to Watson. He said, "Humbug." <laughs> and Holmes said, "Lestrade, this is no time for humbugs." <laughs> Would you like a jelly baby? <laughs> uh, well, it's a good question. I can't think of anything. Um, there, there are two mentions of, came out of, of chocolate in um, in the canon. Really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Obviously. Yeah. Um, and let me see. Uh, it's they are both. Uh, they both have to do with color. Oh. Uh, the uh, the volume that Holmes. Uh, discovered the identity to the lion's mane was a little chocolate and silver vol- volume. Hmm. And then uh, in Wisteria Lodge, uh, his friend and secretary, Mr. Lucas, is undoubtedly a foreigner. Chocolate brown, wily, suave, and cat-like. Oh, uh, interesting. To describe his appearance. Interesting. But no, no chocolate itself. Hmm. Probably a good thing. It would have evened Holmes' temperament out a great deal if he would have had a little seventy <laughs> percent cacao uh, instead of his seven percent solution of <laughs> cocaine. Now that is it. Pass me a block of that extra dark, Watson. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. interesting now. Of course, you. Uh, I mean, speaking of chocolate, um, you know, the land of chocolate, or one of the lands of chocolate, uh, Switzerland. Mm. Uh, contains so much in terms of uh, Holmesian uh, entertainment and stops along the way. There's, of course, the uh, mm. the, the Reichenbach uh, and, and Rosenlaui, where you can visit there. And, of course, our friends at the Sherlock Holmes Society of London have had many excursions, uh, I think at least a dozen excursions now to Switzerland. Oh, really? That many? Yeah, mm. yeah, which is wonderful. Um, but... Of course, the uh, the Sherlock Holmes Museum uh, is, is over that way, or a Sherlock Holmes hey, Museum hey. is over that way. And our, our friend Michael Muir, 
uh, is uh, obviously one of the, uh, the, the the great Swiss Sherlockians and uh, has, has offered people uh, an opportunity to go with him to some of these uh, locations. The museum in um, the Sherlock Holmes Museum in, in uh, Switzerland is actually at the former castle of, uh, was it Adrian or Dennis Conan Doyle? No, I thought it was Adrian. But, I, I, could, but it, I could be wrong. No, I think I think you're right, and that's that's in Lucens. Mm. So, um, and then of course, there's one in Myringen as well. Uh, great opportunity to get your fill of Sherlock Holmes while you're on the continent, and, and of course, while you're there, there's uh, one of the greatest uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, statues there mm. uh, of of Holmes, just kind of seated with his his legs spread out and sitting down on a rock there as he's uh, contemplating things with a pipe. Uh, up to his lips. Hmm. Uh, it's uh, just outside the uh, the Sherlock Holmes Museum in Meiringen. Yeah, I've never. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Switzerland, but I've never been to um, any Sherlockian sites. Oh, what a shame! Yeah. I missed an opportunity there. Yeah. Well, it's all still there. It is. It is. Not the the the, the Reichenbach hasn't uh, dried up at Mm-mm. any time. Mm-mm. Or nor, nor does it plan to. So, yep. well, so there's you know, obviously there's something positive that uh, that comes out of Europe. Um, you know, when you think about it, uh, Sherlock Holmes on his way back from um, you know being in the Far East makes his way back to London in the empty house, uh, and he he does it uh, via Europe. Mm. You know, of, of course, when he when he made his escape from. Uh, the Reichenbach Falls. There, he he wound up in uh, in Florence and um, <laughs> yes. a few other locations. Let's see if we can uh, pull up the uh, the reference here uh, as Holmes comes back. Uh, there it is. Yes, he uh, takes uh, to his heels and finds himself in Florence. Boy, what a run! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of the most uh, risque things ever said in the canon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he describes his escape and um, uh, bleeding, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, a week later, I found myself in Florence with the certainty that no one in the world knew what became of me. He confided in Mycroft to obtain the money. Uh, and then, of course, I traveled for two years in Tibet visiting Lhasa, spending some days with the head Lama, 1L, hmm. which is very peculiar. Um, looked in at Mecca, pay, paid a short but interesting visit to the Khalifa at Khartoum. Hmm. And then, of course, working his way back, he returned to France, spending some months in, a re- in research into the, the coal tar derivatives in a laboratory in Montpellier hmm. in the south of France. And then worked his way back to London from there. So Europe as the gateway of Holmes's escape from and return to London. So see, some good things do come out of Europe. Yes. And, yes. and frankly, friends, for those of you listening, we know there are many of you who are in Europe. Mm-hmm. We do have European listeners. And of course, there are wonderful things in Europe, like you. Like you, yes. Like you and other Sherlockians. I, I can't tell you what a joy it is every time European Sherlockians come over to the States and uh, we get to to see them and to hear about their exploits and hear about how they do things uh, in in their home territory. So, uh, by no means are we casting aspersion on on Europe as a oh, whole. No. Just the Europe of the canon, yeah. which seems a, a strange, remarkable, and scary place at times. Yeah. Friends, how many of you remember that when Ethelwolf's son, Ethelbald, usurped the throne, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex was divided to avoid war, which created the Wessex Press? And what better way to celebrate English history than with a visit to WessexPress.com? If you could clip and collect all the news stories about Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle for the first six months of 1893, you'd have a huge pile of yellowing newsprint, and some serious paper cuts. But 
you'd also have a deep understanding of the literary career and public life of Arthur Conan Doyle. Now you can avoid all that dust and mayhem by buying your copy of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers, Volume 2, for only twenty eight ninety five. Friends, the air is filled with the scent of lilacs, and cherry blossoms are sounding their long whistle down the track. On this glad morning, reach for the pleasure only volumes from the Wes Express can provide. Choose yours today. Ah, there it is. Coming at you like a heart attack once again. The news. <laughs> the news. Well, let's open up the uh, the great big grab bag of Sherlockian news and see what we have today. Mm-hmm. This is uh, we're coming at you uh, a month since our last news report. Of course, we bring you the news every other episode. Uh, of course, you, you'll get interview shows interspersed with our banter and news, and this time around. Uh, some of the things we have to share, and we're pulling this from our Flipboard. And if you don't yet follow our Flipboard or uh, tune into it with regularity, you can find it at ihose.co slash Flip Sherlock. Mm. All lowercase, ihose.co slash Flip Sherlock. Mm. Uh, there are things such as, oh, I don't know. How about 12 brilliant, brilliant literary hotels for book lovers? That's Ooh. something interesting. I like uh, that'll take you uh, really all around the world. But uh, some of them, of course, uh, right here in uh, New York. It could be the uh, Mam- Mamunia in Marrakesh. Oh, Malak. yeah. I still have a towel from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the good news is it's, uh, it's Turkish cotton. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good stuff. And occasionally it gets dirty, so I have to go back and get it washed. Oh, is that it? Yeah, I, I, have, I didn't realize because that. Because nobody else washes it like they do. Uh, and then from Marrakesh, you can get over to the Wanderlust Hotel in uh, in Singapore. A uh, very modern-looking, uh, kind of whimsical option there. But um, But then if you're into old school, why not head over to the Sylvia Beach Hotel in Newport, Oregon? Each room... Is inspired by a different uh, a, a, a different author. A, a, anyone from Agatha Christie to Mark Twain to Dr. Seuss. There's even a Jules Verne room. Hmm. That's in the future, though. Hmm. <laughs> uh, it's very steampunk. <laughs> you could get to the Commons Hotel in Minneapolis, and I know we're. Uh, we're just at the cusp of the, the conclusion of the Norwegian Explorers Conference in Minneapolis there. So uh, there's an opportunity there next time you're back in Minneapolis. Hmm. Um, back in, in Portland, Oregon is the Heathman Hotel uh, right downtown. Oh, and speaking of finding yourself in Florence, if you do find yourself in Florence, there's a restored 15th century villa. Uh, and uh, it, it sits in the hills above Florence, the Il Salviatino, 12 acres of impeccably landscaped grounds, 19th century frescoes, a museum's worth of art, a kitchen that puts out a steady stream of four-star food, and, of course, the library. It's outfitted with volume after volume of classics for guests to borrow and luxurious leather couches to curl up on. How about that? And it's also open for an aperitivo. It turns out that a pre-dinner drink with a good book makes a delightful combination. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. I'm, I'm ready to – I can see why Holmes found himself in Florence. Yeah. And, and speaking of former prime ministers, if you're in North Wales, why not try the Gladstone? Mm. Uh, it's not a hotel but a library that happens to offer accommodation to its patrons. Hmm. Over 250,000 volumes. It's, the, it's second only to the National Library of Wales in its size. Hmm. Uh, and over 300 books have been written within the reading room's hallowed book-lined halls. So there you go. Hmm. So tell us about your bookie travels if you yeah. happen to take any of these up. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And there's some Sherlock Series 4 news about the actor Toby Jones in BBC Sherlock Series 4 will be playing, uh, apparently, Culverton Smith. Oh, how about that? Oh. So, presumably, uh, the, the, uh, one of the, the tales will be uh, the dying detective. Yeah. It would be interesting to see how they play with that, uh, that title. Uh, because, of course, you know, they did Empty Hearse instead of Empty House, uh, Study in Pink instead of Study in Scarlet, Sign of Three instead of Sign of Four. Right. Holmes will assume the persona of an alcoholic, and so it will be the drying detective. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And did you know, Bert, no. that one of our former guests, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yes. is writing... A comic, yeah, about uh, Mycroft. About Mycroft, I did. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Um, from the Hollywood Reporter uh, comes this article that um, he's he's taking uh, he's taking up residence with uh, with novelist Raymond Obstfeld and artist Joshua Cassara for a five issue series, Mycroft Holmes and the Apocalypse Handbook. Hmm. So it follows the Elder Holmes as he travels the world on a mission from the British government to stop a madman intent on utilizing seemingly impossible technology to destroy civilization and disrespect Queen Victoria in the process. But I, I wonder then if this, you know, as we talk to, uh, to Kareem on episode uh, 81, if this is in fact the sequel uh, that, that – uh, he was alluding to uh, that it ended up being a, a, a comic book series rather than uh, another novel. Well, I don't know. One precludes the other. I mean, it could be sort of a tryout of the story. Uh, that could be. That could very well be. It's interesting to see if uh, they'll be jumping all over different genres hmm. uh, and whatnot. Well, and on our Flipboard page, thanks to you, we also uh, answer the age-old question of yes, why, yes. why is it that gin and tonic tastes so good? <laughs> so I will drink them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually fascinating. They, 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 you can read the um, diagram of the chemistry reasons why. Uh, gin and uh, quinine water, or gin and um, tonic and lime, have chemically complementary properties. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, very smart. Yeah, very smart. I like that. And of course, you know, uh, we get whiskey or brandy mentioned more in the canon than gin. Mm. Um, but one of the, uh, the great quotes about gin in the Sherlock Holmes story is from A Study in Scarlet. Uh, the craze for drink had seized him again, and he ordered me to pull up outside a gin palace. <laughs> oh, boy, if they only made palaces to gin, I, get <laughs> I would worship. <laughs> I would worship. Uh, <sighs> and uh, our friend Dan Andreaco over on Baker Street Beat. Yes. He had a really interesting uh, thing to share with regard to a meeting of the illustrious clients of Indianapolis. Yes. Um, they've got a new activity that they're undertaking there. I thought this was very inventive. Um, he, the, the members were challenged to name their favorite and least favorite, their best and worst, and the strongest and weakest of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Hmm. So I thought that was an interesting, because, you know, everybody says, oh, these are the best stories. Well, what does best really mean? Hmm. Right, best, worst, favorite, least favorite. Right. Well, it's like Chris Redman. You know, if it's not the best story, how about it being the best of its kind? Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll hear about that approach, that that very inventive editing approach in our very next episode, ninety nine. Mm. It's I like that previewing that 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 yeah. that teasing that you do there, Bert. Yeah, yeah. Let people know what's coming on. Yeah. It's almost uh, as if I can tell the future. <laughs> How do you do it? I How just keep buying you? lottery tickets. Where will I put the money? And then uh, finally, I just wanted to uh, to call this out uh, on our own pages. 
uh, Matthias Bostrom has once again lent his yes. his own detective skills and his immense knowledge of, uh, of of the canon and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to us as he wonders uh, why Harper Collins hasn't done a better job at doing their research before accusing Conan Doyle of plagiarism. Mm. Uh, there is an upcoming book called The Crime Club and – uh, it's described as the Detective Story Club's first short story anthology. Uh, it's based around a London detective club and includes three newly discovered tales unpublished for 100 years, plus a story bearing an uncanny resemblance to a Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes story, but written some seven years earlier. <clears throat> so they're accusing Conan Doyle of lifting that story and appropriating it for the problem of Thor Bridge. <clears throat> of course, Leave it to Matthias. He rises to Conan Doyle's defense in a superb fashion, mm -hmm. as he did uh, last February when the supposed lost Conan Doyle manuscript was discovered in someone's attic mm -hmm. in Scotland. So all of those and other uh, other news opportunities are there for you to check out in our flipboard. And as Sherlock Holmes said – a very valuable institution if one knows how to – Damn it. Let's try this again. <laughs> and as Sherlock Holmes himself said, The press is a very valuable institution if one knows how to use it. Read all about it. Damn it. Uh, Amanda Lester is back. Amanda Lester, detective. This time, we'd like to introduce you to two additional characters. Simon Binkle and Clive Ng are geeks. They're incredibly talented at just about everything that is uh, scientific and technical. But these two, God bless them, they're always inventing weird stuff. Clive, for example, has devised an acoustic levitator. That's right, you heard that right. An acoustic levitator, which allows him to lift things without even touching them. And believe it or not, acoustic levitation is actually a real thing. And although Paula exaggerates what it can do in her books, it's still a real thing. In the first book, Simon puts together a high-powered microscope using a cell phone and a lens from his Coke bottle glasses. If you'd like to learn about this and additional inventions in the Amanda Lester Detective book series, simply head on over to amandalester.net. My mind rebels at stagnation. Give me problems. Give me work. Give me the most abstruse cryptogram, the most intricate analysis, and I'm in my proper atmosphere. Then I can dispense with artificial stimulants. But I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave mental exaltation. Welcome to the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere quiz program called Mental Exaltation. If you've ever listened to NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, you'll be familiar with our format. However, just in case you haven't caught that, here's how it works. Each episode, we post a qualifying question to our website, IHearOfSherlock.com, and of all of the correct answers submitted, one individual will be chosen at random to become a contestant on Mental Exaltation. This time, all the way from Denton, Texas, joining us is Mr. Steve Mason. Hi, Scott. Hi, Bert. How are you all doing? We're doing great. How are you today? I'm having a lot of fun. We're sitting here with massive thunderstorms this afternoon. Oh, boy. A, 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 Texas, uh, a, a Texas common occurrence in the summer, I would imagine. Yes, it is. Uh, and and more than one of those have delayed a flight that I've been on from time to time. <laughs> Usually around this time on a Sunday too, so that's uh, entirely appropriate. Well, we, um, we like to have them. We like to have them on the weekends. That way, we can't have any outdoor activities. <laughs> fi, fi, I say. Well, anyway, welcome to the program. You have been a a long time listener, and I would love for you to tell our listeners, uh, some of the stuff that you've told Bert 
and I before, particularly about your listening habits with regards to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, I gave up flying uh, soon after the uh, events of 9-11 and for a lot of various reasons. And so for years, I drive everywhere around the country for my job. And so I would like to have all the episodes of I Hear of Sherlock and, and I just repeat them and listen to them everywhere I drive because some of the drives can be up to 15, 16 hours at a time. And instead of just listening to 60s and 70s music, I enjoy listening to your past episodes. They're, they're great to listen to over and over again and hear some of the, the people that you've had on. My goodness. So you're trapped in a car with us for 15, 16 hours. It's either, it's either that or Barry Manilow for 16 <laughs> hours. <laughs> well, it's the lesser of two evils, I see. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's why. So, uh, do do you uh, do you download them to your phone? Do you listen via streaming audio? What, what, what's your preferred mode of listening? I download them as MP3 files to my computer, and then I put them on a uh, thumb drive. And my car has a uh, USB adapter, so I just put them put the thumb drive on that. Ingenious! That is fantastic. What will they think of next? Ah. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe someday we can do a deal with an original equipment manufacturer and every car will come with I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere installed. So it'll save you from that. That, would be, that would be a great way to ha- be able to listen to them. <laughs> well, we want to give people the pleasure of listening to you and your brilliance, hopefully, as you try your way through mental exaltation. So we posted the qualifying question to the website. Do you remember what the question was? I believe it was, what was the smallest country that was mentioned in the canon? That's correct. The smallest European country mentioned in the canon, because we're talking all about Europe this episode. And and your answer was? Vatican City. That is correct. That is correct. That that escaped the few people. Uh, The the second most common answer was Luxembourg, which is understandable, um, because a lot of people don't think of the Vatican as a country. But, of course, it is its its own uh, city, state, country, uh, you name it. So um, you you and a number of others got that, and you were randomly selected. So I, leave well, I appreciate it. it. I leave it to Mr. Hilton Soames to ask us if we are ready to go. Shall the examination proceed? Yes, let it proceed by all means. I am ready. Excellent. Well, here we go. So since this episode is all about Sherlock Holmes and Europe, we're going to ask you three questions about European leaders mentioned by Dr. Watson. You pick the correct answer for at least two, and you win our fabulous prize, which is a copy of Christopher Redmond's latest book, uh, Life, uh, excuse me, Lives Beyond Baker Street. So, I'm a big fan of Christopher, so I would love to win that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, here we go. First question. The Kaiser was, of course, Wilhelm II, the last German emperor and king of Prussia. The Kaiser was mentioned only once in the canon. Was it A, in the Hound of the Baskervilles, when Stapleton traps a butterfly specimen in a hollowed-out Kaiser roll? B, I'm sorry. Careful. That's great. Don't 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 insult our quiz master. <laughs> okay. <laughs> B in the lion's mane when Holmes observes Harold Stackhurst driving a 1907 Kaiser motor car, or C in his last bow when we learn that von Bork could hardly be matched among all the devoted agents of the Kaiser. I'm going to go with C, his last bow. That is correct, sir. I don't know. I don't know how you did it, but yes, that is correct. Okay. On to the second question. Sherlock Holmes occasionally worked for notable European religious leaders. Which of these cases referred to a great European prelate? Was it A, the Musgrave ritual? when Reginald Musgrave describes his ancestor as the right-hand man of the Archbishop of Canterbury, B, 
the Greek interpreter. When Mycroft looks into the Melas case at the request of the Greek patriarch, or C. Black Peter, when Watson reports Holmes investigated the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca at the express desire of His Holiness the Pope. Well, that one's a little bit tougher, but I'm going to go with C again. You are on a roll, sir. You are on a roll. And not a right. Kaiser roll, though. That's that's the thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have effectively qualified to win the prize. So the third one, I mean, this, this could be just a throwaway for you, but if you want to go three for three, this is your opportunity. Okay. Is there like a is there like a double or nothing or? <laughs> hey, you want to put it all up against this one? That's up to you. But we'll we'll see. <laughs> Um, no, I, I still I would love to have Chris's book, so I think I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. Stick. Wise, wise choice, wise choice. I like it. Okay, third question. Napoleon, of course, refers to, uh, or excuse me, Napoleon, of course, appears as a statue in the Six Napoleons, but the name Napoleon appears other times in the canon. Was it a in the second stain? When Watson says the illustrious Lord Bellinger, twice Premier of Britain, had the tenacity of Napoleon? B. In the engineer's thumb. When Victor Hatherley arrives at Dr. Watson's surgery holding his bandaged hand inside his waistcoat just like Napoleon. Or C. The Red-Headed League in the form of 30,000 gold Napoleons kept in the vaults of the Coburg branch of the city and suburban bank. It would definitely be C, the, the third one, where they were talking about the Napoleons in the bank. That is correct, sir. Thank you very much. So you you saw it was three Cs all the way. So you, you spotted the trend that are... <laughs> A tricky you know, quiz I think I think when I took the SAT test, they always said pick C if you didn't know what the answer was. <laughs> That's great, and you know you were you were really up a creek if uh, there were only A and B to choose from. So, <laughs> well, then I would have gone with none of the above. <laughs> uh, that that tends to be my answer for many things in life. Well, <laughs> Steve, you have been a consummate contestant here on Mental Exaltation, and you continue to be a consummate fan of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Uh, we thank you sincerely for your participation, and uh, we wish you well. Well, I appreciate it, and, and good luck up with everything that y'all continue to do. I, this is a wonderful way to spread the news about Sherlock Holmes, and I appreciate you doing it every other week. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Why? Oh. That can only mean one thing. Yes, it's time to light the gas lamps and open the windows. People are genuinely relieved that we're almost done with the show. Yes. Well, in this case, we reach into the gas lamp archive and we find absolutely nothing from the Baker Street Journal with regard to Europe. So we thought we would reach on over to the Sherlock Holmes Journal. Why, they're in Europe, aren't they? Last yeah, they, time I they looked. very much are. The, on the left-hand the, uh, part of it, yeah. Yeah, the official publication of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a copy uh, of the best of the Sherlock Holmes Journal, Volume 1, here in my hand, edited by Nick Utekin. Um, but I also happen to have an early run of the SH. Uh, J as well, but uh, I don't want to crack those, so I'm cracking this one. In this case, the article is about something right in Piccadilly Circus, the Criterion Plaque. Mm. This plaque commemorates the historic meeting early in 1881 at the original Criterion Long Bar of Dr. Stamford and Dr. John H. Watson, which led to the introduction of Dr. Watson to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Beneath was a smaller plate inscribed, erected by the Baritsu chapter of the Baker Street Irregulars, Tokyo. Dr. Watson once claimed an acquaintance of women which extended over three continents. The plaque unveiled at the Criterion Restaurant on January 3, 1953, has connections with four continents. 
It was Australian-born Richard Hughes who induced the Baritsu chapter of Tokyo, a science society of New York's Baker Street Irregulars, to erect this memorial in the heart of London. The plaque is erected by courtesy of Criterion in Piccadilly Limited on the north wall of the Criterion building facing Piccadilly Circus and immediately outside Forte's Puritan Maid Cafeteria, which now occupies the site of the original Long Bar. The Long Bar itself no longer exists, though it has a modern counterpart in the White Bear Inn, only a few doors away. The proceedings on January 3rd were inaugurated by Mr. Guy Warwick, welcoming on behalf of the Baker Street Irregulars the large crowd, which naturally congregates without excuse in Piccadilly Circus. With praise to the Master and thanks to those who had made possible this unique event, not omitting what Fabian of Twelfth Night described as the infallible criterion, Mr. Warwick introduced ex-superintendent Robert Fabian, formerly of Scotland Yard. Mr. Fabian recalled that he had read and reread Watson's saga with profit. It is true that he did not take drugs, play the fiddle, smoke in excess, or laze around in a dressing gown, but the master's methods were worthy of emulation by present-day detectives. Mr. Fabian then released a crimson curtain revealing a circular bronze plaque bearing the inscription in white enamel lettering. As the ceremony concluded, Mr. Holmes himself, in the person of Mr. Carlton Hobbs, arrived in a handsome cab, which had once carried Irving to the Lyceum. Dressed in his traveling cloak and deer stalker, Mr. Holmes obligingly posed for numerous photographs. Then, with the aid of his magnifying glass, he trailed some footprints into the erstwhile long bar. The ceremony was declared an overwhelming success, as was the subsequent reception given by Messrs. Fortes. I was standing at the Criterion Bar, wrote the idler of the Empire, when someone tapped me on the shoulder, and turning round I recognized young Stamford. It was a fortuitous and momentous meeting, and it has now been fittingly commemorated. All Homesians owe a great debt of gratitude to Mr. Richard Hughes and Mr. Charles Forte. Well, there you have it. Well, isn't that nice? Yeah. What a nice It's memory. almost like we were there. What a nice memory to Guy Warwick. Now Guy Warwick wrote uh Sherlock Holmes in music, didn't he? That's true, yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah, that's one yeah, of yeah. my one of my favorite books. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow, and there's a great European event. Uh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And that was uh just a, about a year or two after the conclusion of the um uh, of the, uh, the the grand exhibition, the 1951 exhibition there, in which um, the, uh, the 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 display that ended up in the Sherlock Holmes pub right. on um, uh, just off of Trafalgar there uh, was originally exhibited. So wonderful to to to, to read and to hear. Well, and, I think we've... well, but speaking of things to read and hear, we want to yes. hear from you. Oh. Please, we do. Yes. How, how, how would folks go about doing that? Well, they can call us. They can mutter imprecations at us. They can start a rumor. They can <laughs> vote us in. If you're in one of the states of the United States and your primary is still not held, please, if you just submit IHOs as a write-in candidate on your election form, we'll be notified by a very angry Congress and realize that we've reached you. And of course – as long as you are uh, trying to get in touch with us. And, and again, any mode will suffice. Just get over to IHearOfSherlock.com for all the ways to contact us, from, yes. from phone to email to carrier pigeon, uh, you know, uh, rolling coconuts down the street, whatever. Yeah. It's all there on our site. But, yes. of course, while you're there, yes. you can also find a link to our listener survey. Oh, right. We would really appreciate hearing from you. We'd like to know know, how we're doing with regard to the content, but we'd also like to know about you. We'd like to know about what you do and 
and and who you are and all the like. Our sponsors would like to know this. It's it's absolutely anonymized. No one will ever find out what your actual answers are. They're all aggregated, but they're done in a way that help us grow the show. It helps future sponsors and current sponsors alike understand who you are. So click on the survey link, but also if you want to go directly to it, it's ihose.co slash ihose survey. Mm. Again, all lowercase, ihose.co slash ihose survey. It would really help us out if you took that survey. Mm. And, you know, while you're at it, while you're there at the keyboard. Yeah, yes, yes. Type, type in bitly.com, or no, excuse me, bit, bit dash ly, bitly slash I hear of Sherlock. That'll take you on over to iTunes. You can leave us a rating or a review. Oh. Very, very pleased to see what we've got there. And we will share with you on our 100th episode some of what you've been saying because it's been very kind for the most part. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you could add your voice to the mix there, we would appreciate it. Yeah. You know, we do such great work taking helping people deal with this surplus of free time that they have. I uh, and it's quite. It takes a lot of time for us to dream these things up. So yes, please fill out the survey, send us notes, leave us reviews, send us money. That works too. Our send, friends at Patreon. Send right? us your laundry. You know, for two dollars a shirt, Scott or I will be happy to do the ironing and pressing and mail it back to you. Cod. That would work. Yeah. Uh, although you know, we, we'd prefer to get your your crisp, clean bills. Yes, we would. Uh, and you know who's good for crisp, clean bills? Who? It's who? Mary Miller. Oh, Mary our Miller. Sponsor. Oh, God bless Patreon. her. Patreon. She God is tireless with her efforts, uh, both in terms of Sherlock Holmes and Jane Austen, but she's very kind to us on Patreon. If you see that become a patron button, push it. See what happens. Yeah. Go check out some of our stuff there and see if it's worth your while. Yeah, you can patronize us. We don't care. Yeah. We'll take it. But we do care enough. To wish you and bid you a, a, a fine day, a fine evening, whenever you're listening to us. Mm -hmm. And signing off now, this is Scott Monty. Yes, that's Scott Monty, and this is Bert Wolder. And huh? to, together, we, we said, like to observe. Yes. Yes. The, the games of foot. Of foot. Well, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Hey, wait a minute. I've got a great idea. Why don't we save all the sponsor reads for the 100th episode? Yeah, it'll it'll be a complete sponsor read. Yeah. Just That'll be our entire show. Different spot. We can go back and take all these commercials from the different episodes and just stitch them together. And let's say for those people who think our shows are too long, you know, a three-hour episode. <laughs> you know what we could do actually this isn't, this isn't a bad idea we could um we could put out an episode that is only sherlock holmes brand spots oh oh i'd like that compilation i'd like that yeah the best ones not yeah. not, not the 100th but you know maybe just a, a special episode yeah